Well, I'm glad you're here this morning because today we're going to continue this conversation on counterfeit. Things that we place our trust in, things that we rely on that end up usually letting us down somewhere down the line. And today, it's that lure of the next big thing. So I brought something with me this morning, uh, just a simple yardstick here. Don't worry, uh, I'm not the kind of pastor where if you haven't been here in a few weeks, I'm going to you know, lay the smack down or anything like that. And, but I want to just ask you this question. While this is used to measure lots of things, and maybe you could have you know, stuck it in the snow this week to see how much snow or ice you had, I want to ask you this question. I feel like going like this, you know? I want to ask you this question, right? How do you measure your own life? How do you measure up? I mean, how do you measure success in your life? If you remember back to grade school, maybe this was you. I remember being a kid, and the way that I measured success was when I got picked for football games out at recess, right? You wanted to go first round. You wanted to get picked in the first couple of rounds at least. You wouldn't measure up to being very successful if you were one of the last kids to be picked, right? So you always tried to gain some status by your, your draft, where you were drafted. Or, or you remember ever having like races with other kids in school? And you guys would all line up at the same time, and you'd like argue for hours and hours. You'd be sitting in math class and be like, I'm faster than you. I know I'm faster than you. I could beat you anywhere, right? And then you get out onto the playground, and finally you get to test it out. Man, I, I remember being out there with, with, with Billy Wagner and, and Phil Heimsoff and all these kids in my class, and I just wanted to gain status. I wanted to be known for something. So I would... I would run my little legs off. Yeah, like try and be as fast as possible because if I could do that, if I was faster than everybody else, I'd at least gain a little bit of status. Oh yeah? I'm the fastest guy in the class. And you gain that status. You're able to measure up your success just a little bit more. But see, things have probably changed a little bit for you since then. My guess is that you measure success a little bit differently. Maybe now today you measure your success in terms of status. And what I did this week was I sat down. Sorry, my microphone's a little loose. If this thing keeps popping, I might just have to hold it. There we go. I'll just hang on to it. So this week I sat down and talked with someone who has been, had lots of experience in the business world. And I said, what is it that people measure their status by? How do they measure up? What, what makes people feel like they measure up, like they're successful? And, and I'm sure you could resonate with this in a lot of different ways. Usually, we measure success in three different kind of compartments of our life. And maybe this isn't true for you in all ways, but if you look at our culture, it's not hard to see that much of our success or our status is measured by what kind of house we have, what kind of cars we drive, or what kind of clothes you wear. You want to have the things that say to everybody else, look at me, I may not be the fastest kid on the playground anymore, but I measure up. I make X amount of dollars. I'm successful in this kind of way, and that's what determines how successful we are. And usually, if you can't have all three, the house, the car, and the clothes, you try and get at least one of those things. And so people will aim for at least one of those compartments. One of those compartments, if you can't afford the house, you can't afford the car, then let's at least have the clothes or the appearance that when you walk into the room, people will notice you and say, that person looks like they got it together. They must be successful, right? It's the lure of how we measure up. And if you are fortunate enough to be able to wear the clothes, then let's not just have people look at us when we actually start to walk into the room, but let's have them notice us when we pull up in the parking lot. Let's make sure we have the right car. Let's make sure we're driving the Audi 8 series and that, that way people will notice us when we pull up and they'll say, man, that person, now they have it together because they don't even... They, they not only look professional in the office, but they look professional before they even get out of the car. They must have status. 
But then if you're going to have people over to your house, you want them to be able to feel hospitable. You want them to feel like, man, now this is a great place. You want them to kind of laud you and, and, and praise you for the kind of house that you have too. So if it's not just the clothes and not just the car, then it's also the house. And having all of these things, now you're really starting to measure up because the people around you, I'm sorry, we can just, what should we do? Should we turn the mic off? Can I just talk into Kim's mic? Can we do that? I'm sorry, you guys. We'll just keep rocking with this. Is this okay? Yeah? We want to make sure we have some kind of audio so for folks who are snowed in this week, they can watch later on uh, this week online. You want to measure up in all three of those things because the more you can have status in those three areas, and there's plenty others that we could list, but those seem to be the three primary ones. The more you can measure up, then the more status you have. And what's tempting in that is that every time we acquire a new level of status, if you will, every time we're able to upgrade the, the wardrobe, every time we're able to upgrade the car or have the bigger, better TV or have the bigger, better house, then that says a little bit more about our status. But what does that do for your legacy? Because there's a big difference between the status that you acquire based on what you have or what you don't have and the legacy that you leave behind. Today we're going to dig into Romans chapter 12. So if you would, grab your Bibles or pull up uh, Romans 12 on the app on your phone. Let's take a look at this section of Scripture for just a moment. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse one, and I want you to pay attention to what it is that Paul says in Romans 12 that we should measure ourselves to. My guess is, and you're probably already there with me, he probably doesn't say it's your house, your car, or your clothes, right? Let's take a look here. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse one. Paul says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the ways of this world, to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test. You will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let me just grab this microphone really quickly. transformed by the renewing of your mind. Patterns of this world, the lure of the next big thing, tend to capture our eyes just a little bit. They capture our attention because we can measure those things. And probably more importantly, when people look at you according to the patterns of this world, i.e. The, the next big thing, the house, the car, the clothes, whatever it may be for you, they can measure you. And somewhere deep inside of us, we get some kind of satisfaction from seeing other people notice where we live, what we drive, what we wear, who we hang with, whatever it may be. It's that next big thing. Do you have the latest iPhone? Do you have the newest house on the market. Do you have a new house? Do you have an old house? Do you have a big house, a small one? What part of the city do you live in? What kind of car do you drive, right? All these things 
tend to somehow signify to the people around us that person has status. But what Paul's inviting us to do is to consider that there's something more important than status. And I would argue that what he's getting at is that instead of status, as the world would say, it's legacy, what you leave behind. And here's why I say that. Keep reading. Let's pick it up again. Just at the end of verse 3. Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. The reason why Paul is getting at this idea of legacy is because that faith brings you. Faith, which is our measurement, right? God gives us this faith, and it's what we measure ourselves with now. The reason why it's so much more about legacy rather than status is because now other people are involved. Now, because of your faith, you become one body. It's no longer about how you stand out against the crowd. It's how you become part of a team. Where the lure of the next big thing elevates your status and makes you stand out, faith invites you in to be a part of community. And if you were to start to wrestle with why is faith our measurement, the first reason is this, because it invites you to be a part of community. Whereas status, or the next big thing, is all about standing out, isolating yourself, making sure that you measure up higher than the person next to you, the coworker. Can you get the promotion that they can? Can you work harder so that in your job you'll be elevated in status? Do you get the bigger paycheck? There's so much lure in that because in that we feel more significant. And yet what Paul's inviting us to is to feel significance in the context of community. Faith is the measurement not of status and not even just the legacy you leave behind, but it's the measurement of who we are which is so freeing because no longer do you have to be the person with the bigger better newer faster taller whatever it may be thing no longer do you have to be consumed with this idea that that you'll gain status based on what you have over and above other folks Now, it may not seem like a really big deal, but it becomes a really big deal when you realize just how much we depend on it. In this conversation I was having with somebody this week, they shared lots of stories with me about folks around them that they've seen come and go over the years who put so much weight on the next big thing that it deeply affected their relationships deeply affected their identity, deeply affected who they are. One person uh, came in and interviewed for a really high position job in a company, Uh, one of those CEO, CFO, COOs, and anything with a C in front of it, right? He was after that kind of job, something with title, because with title you gain status. And the person wanted that status so much that he said to the soon-to-be boss, you don't have to give me a promotion. You don't have to, you don't have to pay me more money. I'll, all I want is the title and the business card that says my title on it. Because then at least I'll be able to measure up. At least I'll have this status. At least then I'll have this title. Didn't even want more money. Just wanted the title. Another person came into the office at the time was living uh, in a different state, came in to interview, and uh, was interviewed by this person. 
was asked all these questions. Turns out this guy would be a great fit for the job. So he brings his wife out to Nashville, spends a weekend here, gets to know the city a little bit more with his, with his wife. She doesn't like it. She's more of a, a small town girl, but he loves the city life. So Nashville, very appealing for him, but for her, it just wasn't home. It just wasn't going to be a good fit. This was not the place for her but was offered the job and took the job. A few months into it, things got really bumpy in their relationship and their marriage. His thinking behind the whole thing, and, and husbands, I would just really advise you not to take this stance, but his whole thinking was, well, this is the promotion of a lifetime. This is what I've been working so long for. If she doesn't like it, she can just go home to her mom. Guys, probably not a good thing to say to your wife, okay? Not a good move. But he put so much in this idea of moving here. Because it was the promotion, because it was the next rung on the ladder, because it was the luring that, that was just pulling him higher up the ladder to the higher pay grade, to the promotion and the title, that he was willing to forsake even his marriage for this job that within six months of taking the job here, moving here, the person that originally interviewed him and offered the job said, you're ruining your marriage over this job. If you and your wife don't quit and move back to where you're from, I'm going to fire you to save your marriage. The guy moved back, saved his marriage, still married today. Because something had to be more important than the next big thing. Another man interviewed for this job, put so many eggs in this basket, and was under such a financial tension in such a tough spot that when he interviewed for the job, found out that he didn't get it, he was needing this job because he put himself in such a tough situation financially. When he didn't get the job, he was driving in to work one day, couldn't, just could not stand the pressure that he was now facing because he didn't get the promotion with the bigger paycheck. He ended up committing suicide on his way to work because he didn't get the thing that he had put all of his hope in, all of his trust in and saw no other way out. There's such a demand, such pressure to stand out, to gain some kind of posture in life that it gives us status, that we end up putting all of our trust in that. And if it goes so far down a road, we find out somewhere in that journey that we've put way too much hope, way too much trust in that very thing. And we end up falling, being broken, breaking relationships. But the thing that faith does, the complete opposite of the next big thing, if you will, the thing that faith does, the thing and the way that God measures us, instead invites us to be a part of community invites us, instead of being isolated where the pressure is, you can't withstand this pressure, you can't hold up under this pressure, you get to be a part of this body of Christ, as Paul wrote, writes here in Romans chapter 12. See, but there's, there's another reason why this is so important for us to be measured by faith, is because when we start to set our eyes on what's going on around us and whether or not we can measure up, it starts to take our eyes off of Jesus. See, when there, when there is no faith or when we're lacking in our faith or when our faith is weak, what we tend to do is look around at the people around us to feel significant in who we are, to, to solidify our status, if you will. But what faith does, this gift from God calling us his own son, his own daughter, when he draws us back to himself, 
faith causes us to lift our eyes to him. It solidifies who we are. It solidifies our status, not as too weak, too poor, too broken, whatever status culture would measure you by. It says, you are my son, you are my daughter. That's why Paul says this in Romans chapter 12. Look back there at these few verses. Verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. And you know what's amazing about this? Is that your status doesn't require you to acquire anything to gain any kind of relevance or significance with the Father. Instead of you having to go purchase something to gain status, the Father has already purchased you. That's the beauty of faith and why we can measure ourselves with faith instead of status or the next big thing. Because in faith, we see that Jesus laid out his life for us, purchased our identity to call you son, to call you daughter to restore you. And your status now with God, completely different than the status you have to purchase by going after the next big thing. You know, as I was asking these questions uh, to this person this week, I said, you know, if you were going to give us some wisdom on how to approach this kind of situation, or how you can avoid putting too much weight in your status that is measured by worldly standards. What kind of wisdom would you want to share with us? This person shared three different priorities. The first one was all about family. He said, there's a big difference between providing for your family and caring for your family. A lot of times you feel pressure to work the long hours, to work hard for the promotion. In fact, there's so many folks who have sacrificed their family for the sake of providing for their family that they go after the provision part and sacrifice actually having a relationship with their family. So he shared first priority. If you were going to set some priorities, look at family first. Know that it's good for you to provide, but always look to care for your family, not just provide for your family. The second one was this, plan for your future. Plan for your future. This individual was sharing just story after story with me of folks who would have more than enough means to be able to uh, retire early, to um, set aside their daily pleasures, if you will, the, the bigger house, the nicer car, whatever it may be, but made choices along the way that would sacrifice the future, uh, their retirement, and even the future for their children because they wanted the bigger, better thing now. Instead, he shared a quote from Dave Ramsey. It says this, if you want to live like no one else, then live like no one else. When everybody else is going after the newer car, the bigger house, the nicer TV, whatever it may be, don't go that path. Instead, plan for your future. Get a handle on your finances now so that you don't put those things in jeopardy. In fact, I um, want to just give you a very tangible tool um, that if you're like me, when it comes to the financial piece, you just need somebody else to help you with it, right? Math classes ended a long time, for, long time ago for me, so I need some help when it comes to numbers and those kinds of things. And if, if that's you, if you don't have that financial plan, 
Um, we just want to tangibly resource you with an opportunity to connect um, and have some of that planning alongside of you. Um, and, and you can just kind of say, man, this is crazy. I don't want to do this or anything like that. That's totally cool. But if you need help in that area or don't have any resources in that, I just want to share with you um, the story of Thrivent Financial. Thrivent is an organization that was started by some Lutheran Christians a long time ago that was all about helping provide financial guidance for people in their own lives, plan for the future. The beautiful thing about Thriven is that it partners with churches and, and church plants and ministries and missions in so many different ways. It's so awesome. The thing that sets them apart from just your normal financial planning um, organization is that this company is a not-for-profit and where most financial planning organizations have to pay taxes based on the revenues of their company, this organization, because they're not, not for profit, instead of paying taxes, are required to give that money away that otherwise would go to the IRS. They're able to give that money away to help start churches like Rhythm City Church, to help bless ministries. In fact, um, I heard, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, 25% of the budget for uh, Trinity Hope, which is an awesome organization that we've partnered with and have a huge heart for, is supported by Thriven financially, an amazing ministry that helps feed kids down in Haiti. They're required to give this money away. And so if you can get plugged in with them or if you have questions or, or you just want to pick up some information, I've actually asked our Thriven rep, um, Luke, to bring along some information. And so he's placed some Thrivent packets and stuff back by the table back there. You can talk to Luke today if you wanted to. Um, this isn't any kind of sales pitch for him. It's just a blessing and a resource offered to you that if these are things that you struggle with and that's no way a priority for you, that you can start to ask some of those questions. So if you want to, you can grab that as you head out today. The last thing is this, the last priority, tithing was what this person shared with me. The first priority was uh, there's a difference between providing for your family and caring for your family. The second one, planning for your future. And then the third one was tithing. Um, I think it's really interesting how we view tithing. Sometimes we see tithing as kind of whatever's left over and whatever we have room for at the end of our, our monthly expenses, we give to God. But what God calls us to do is to give with a cheerful heart in our first fruits. The miscon misconception behind that is that God is robbing us and therefore we're running out of money to buy the house, to buy the car, to buy the clothes, whatever it may be. And yet, it's an opportunity for us to be generous and to bless the people around us. I've had so many people share with me that before they started tithing, they were convinced that it, either there wouldn't be enough, they would run out or God wouldn't provide, or that they would just hate it and want to stop soon after. And yet time after time, I hear story about people who start tithing and giving actually find out God blessing it back in their life beyond what they thought. Maybe not necessarily monetarily, but the joy that they receive in giving to bless people just fills their hearts, and it becomes a priority for them. The reason why we talk about those three priorities is because when the bigger, better thing becomes our God that we worship and place our trust in, when it becomes the counterfeit God in our lives— those relationships, those things begin to suffer and fall by the wayside. There's a difference between status that we measure and the legacy we leave behind filled with faith and hope and love, which will be what we talk about next week. And the way you can tell the way you know that this is true is if I told you today or let's say tomorrow morning you went to the doctor and you were diagnosed with some kind of life-threatening disease and you were given one month to live. My guess is that inside of you, you would have 
absolutely no desire to go put a down payment on a house that's way outside of your budget. My guess is that you wouldn't have the urge to go down to the Maserati store and pick up a car that you could drive for the next couple of weeks. My guess is that those types of things that in our worldly culture would give you status, would make you measure up, those things would start to fade away because you care a lot more about the relationships, the things that you could pass on to the people around you, the faith-filled hope that you can give to your family, to your friends, to your coworkers, to your church, to your city. It stirs inside of you in such a way that says, I want to leave a legacy of faith, not just gain status for a moment. I shared this a few weeks ago, but it still just is driving who I am at the core of of, of myself in, the, in that it stirs in my mind and guides me in the decisions I'm making. And it was about a month and a half ago, my family and I drove up to Nebraska and uh, went to my grandmother's funeral. And my dad was sharing in the message all the things that she had done to prepare for her own funeral 15 years beforehand. The songs that she had picked out the order of worship that she had designed, the, the people chosen to be the pallbearers for her funeral. She even made vases only for the flowers for her funeral. They weren't just vases that she made that happened to be in her china cabinet and holding other flowers around the house. She made these vases specifically for her own funeral. And my dad said, you know, it's probably good wisdom for us to live every day knowing that we're going to die but planning to live forever. The counterfeit God that lures us towards the bigger, better, newer thing can deceive us in ways that it rips away who we are. And yet at the core of the faith that God has gifted us reminds us Nothing can take that from you. There is no greater status to have than son or daughter of the Father. There is no greater legacy to leave behind than how you bless the people around you. So the way that we can respond to that is instead of looking around and saying, do I measure up to the people next to me, is actually to have a heart of gratitude. In fact, Uh, Someone just shared with me just recently um, that there's an author who spends her time researching people who are living in shame. She is a shame researcher. She under she helps people understand um, what what it's like to live a wholehearted life. And the thing that she said was that it's impossible to experience joy without practicing gratitude. When we're so busy comparing ourselves and seeing how we measure up based on our status and what we own or what we have, it creates in us this desire to always have the next thing, the bigger, better thing. But instead of looking around, let's look up. Let's look to what God has already given us. Let's be thankful for what he's already blessed us with. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray for us in just a moment, and the band's going to come up and and sing, and and we're going to have an opportunity to collect our offering and worship and also text in our prayer requests. And at that time, I want to encourage you to go ahead and text in your prayer prayer requests like you do every week. You text in the word RCC Pray and your prayer request to 22333. You can just pull your phones out now if you want to. But I want to encourage everybody just to flood the screen with things that you're thankful for. And you can be completely materialistic in this situation. If God has given you a really nice car, then be thankful for it. If God has given you a really nice house, then be thankful for it. There's nothing wrong with having those things. It becomes the the point when those are the things we place our trust in, those are the things that we rely on to gain us status. And we end up replacing God with those things. 
So, instead of worshiping God's creation, instead of worshiping the creator, let's give thanks to the creator for the creation he's put in our life. Let's give thanks to God for what he's provided us with.